All right, church. Well, let's go ahead, grab a seat, and we're going to turn to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. We're going to be in verses 20 to 26 today. Luke chapter 6, verses 20 to 26. Then looking up at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, because the kingdom of God is yours. Blessed are you who are now hungry, because you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, because you will laugh. And blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, insult you, and slander your name as evil, because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Take note, your reward is great in heaven, for this is the way their ancestors used to treat the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your comfort. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are now laughing, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for this is the way their ancestors used to treat the false prophets. Merry Christmas all. Today I want to talk to you from this idea, a guide to flourishing, a guide to flourishing. I wonder, when you think about this idea of flourishing, what comes to mind? When you think about what it means to grow and develop in a healthy and vigorous way, what are the things that you would sit down and think about? If I were to give you an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, sit you down in a room for a few hours and say, write down on this sheet of paper everything about what you think it means to flourish, I wonder what would show up on your paper. I wonder if your list and Jesus' list might be a little bit different. I wonder if on your list you might say that flourishing is money. I wonder if on your list would be flourishing is success or being in a relationship or maybe for some of us retirement is what it means to flourish. I wonder if maybe for some of us it would be things like not being anxious or not feeling like you got to live up to a standard in the world. And yet we come to Jesus and he gives us a different list about what it means to flourish. You see, for many of us, flourishing is an idea that doesn't feel very pragmatic. That we look at the idea of flourishing, we're like, I don't have time to think about flourishing. I'm too busy trying to survive. I'm just trying to get through one more nighttime routine. I'm trying to get through one more day at work that I hate. I'm just trying to get through one more moment of anxiety. I don't have time to think about that highfalutin idea of flourishing. Or maybe for some of us, we would say, I'm too busy thinking about the future. I'm thinking about what it means to be a millionaire by the time that I retire. I'm I'm busy thinking about the relationship that I want to be in. I'm thinking about what my future is going to look like, and so I'm too busy grinding it out and hustling today to try to make that happen than to think about flourishing. And I wonder if as a result of that, the inner voice that is yelling at us about the way that we're living our life, we ignore it and we just kind of go through the motions of life thinking, well, maybe someday flourishing will just happen to me. You see, flourishing is a way that we were made. As a matter of fact, when we come all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, what do we find? But a flourishing garden where everything is multiplying and healthy and good and vibrant in the world around us. So much so that actually this this river that goes through something known as the Garden of Eden actually goes out and it spreads out in four different directions and gave life to four great cities around it. And what we recognize is from the very beginning that you and I were created to flourish. Yet somewhere along the way, we were asked a question, did God really say? (laughs) Is God holding out on you? That's maybe some of the questions that you and I have. God, do you really know what's best for me? And so there's a phrase that's inserted into the way that we see the world that says, no, you certainly won't die. In fact, God knows when you eat it, your eyes will be opened And you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. What the serpent is saying is, listen, you think that you're flourishing now, but listen, what you need to do is you need to reach out of something outside of you. And when you have that thing, then you'll be happy. I don't know how many of us grew up with marketing 
and advertising and messaging that said, you're not enough. Your internal life is not enough. What you need is something from the outside to be enough for you. And I want us to catch this because what we're going to be talking about today when it comes to flourishing is this idea of a messaging that says that flourishing happens from the outside in. That as we watch television, that people do a great job of making you feel like you're not good looking enough, that you don't smell good enough, that you don't have enough money, that you don't drive enough of the, the right car. And so all of this messaging is oriented around, the, for, you'll be good if you have from the outside in all the things that you long for. It's perhaps a messaging as old as humanity itself, the very messaging that goes back to the Garden of Eden. And so we come to the Sermon on the Plain. It's a corollary to the Sermon on the Mount in the book of Luke. And so we see that Jesus begins to talk about what it looks like to live in the kingdom of heaven. And this idea of the Beatitudes actually comes from, I, I looked it up, it's from a French meaning supreme happiness. It's this idea of us trying to say, what does it look like to live the good life, to live a life that flourishes? And Jesus gives us a very different idea of what it means to flourish. You see, as we look at the world around us and as we look at things like social media, that it says, well, you have the maximalists that say just buy as much as you can and the one who dies in the end with the most stuff wins. But then the minimalists come along and say, listen, the maximalists, you guys have no idea. You need to have less things. And so it's really the people who have less things that win in the end, but both are oriented around things. It's the people who come to us and say, listen, it's the right politics that you have. And if you have the right politics, then you'll be able to know what it's like to flourish. And then it's the people on the other side that say, no, politics mean nothing. And so don't even try. And yet at the end of the day, both of them are trying to realize what it means to flourish. And we kind of get this idea of what in the world does it mean to flourish. And what we needed was somebody from the outside who made us to come in and tell us exactly what it means to flourish. You see, there's a question of how do we really know that the God that we know is the real God? You know, there's a question. If we just kind of sat down and if you were to say, okay, I want to think like philosophers and just say, what do I think God is like? If that was the case, how would we know that it's the right God? And the truth is, as we come to Christianity, that Christianity doesn't say that you sit down and figure it out. The joy and beauty of Christianity is that God came to us, that the truth was we couldn't figure it out on our own. And so we needed someone to reveal to us the truth who was God himself. If you know philosophy, I don't know how many of you are reading it in your spare time, but Plato has something called the allegory of the cave. And so this was his theory as he said, the allegory of the cave is imagine that there are people who grew up in a cave all their lives. And so they're shackled to the wall of the cave and there's a fire behind them. And there's people who are walking by and objects walking by behind them. And all they see is the shadow on the wall in front of them. They don't actually see the real object. They just see the shadow of it. And so he said, listen, all of us are basically living life, looking at a shadow realm compared to that which is really real. And can I tell you that philosophers, that those who believe psychologists have figured out the truth are just simply those who are looking at the shadows on the wall. It's not until Jesus comes into the world as that which is real and that which is true that he gives us the revealed truth for the world. And so it's a big deal, Advent season for the church, because it means that it's not just you and I trying to look at shadows on the wall and try to figure out reality. No, reality incarnated itself to us in Jesus Christ. And so now we don't have to guess at what is God like. We just simply look to Jesus and we see him there in Jesus in front of us. And so it's in this that we see one scholar, Jonathan Pennington, say this. As prophet and sage, Jesus is offering and inviting his hearers into the way of being in the world that will result in their true and full flourishing now and in the ages to come. And so it's in this that Jesus reveals to us as the true prophet, as the true one who comes to bring us what it means to really live and flourish in the world, the message that comes from the heart of God himself. 
I would love to be able to walk through each one of these Beatitudes, but we'd be here for a while. And so I'm just going to talk through a kind of overview of what these Beatitudes mean. And then I'm going to use one as an example for how we can talk about these Beatitudes, because this idea of the blessed life, of what it means to truly flourish is the message that Jesus gives us in the Sermon on the Plain. And so rather than the messaging of the world around us that says flourishing happens from the outside in, Jesus shows up and he says, actually flourishing happens from the inside out. That rather than needing something external to try to grab onto, to try to fulfill our desires, that he says, you're getting it wrong, that to flourish means that we start from the inside and then we work to the outside. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And so here's how Luke begins in verse 20. It says, then looking up at his disciples... He said, now I want to stop there. We've gotten a long way and I want to stop because what's happened is that Jesus has called out a group of people who will follow after him. Now, not all of those who listen to Jesus, who are around Jesus or who are blessed by Jesus are disciples of Jesus. Just simply because you show up at the right place to listen to a message doesn't mean that you have the right heart. Simply because you've gone to church because your family did and you have roots in the church dating all the way back to Martin Luther doesn't mean that you really have experienced Christ. You see, Christianity is not about a list of moralities. That's kind of sometimes what we end up doing is we say, well, listen, you want to be a good person? Here's a list of all the good things that Jesus told you to do. And here's a list of all the bad things Jesus told you not to do. And so try to go and live likewise. But Christianity is not a list of morality. Christianity is not a list of all the things that you should do or how you should show up. Christianity is not about beliefs that are agreed with. So you are wondering, well, what in the world is Christianity all about then? Christianity is the moment when Jesus calls his disciples to him. And as he shares this word with them personally, that it changes them from the inside out because Jesus is walking with them. Christianity is asking the question, is Jesus incarnating himself in you? Is he dwelling in you? And it's this idea of, is he changing you from the inside out because he himself is living a new kind of life through you from the inside. And so Christianity is not about all the things that you should do or shouldn't do or all the ways that you should show up or shouldn't show up. It is this. Is Jesus himself incarnating inside of you a new reality as a new humanity that is founded on Jesus Christ as his presence dwells with you? Because each one of us know the restlessness of our own soul, that we long for this idea to find a home and we wonder where is home as we reach toward other things during the holiday season and we say, well, maybe Black Friday is home. Maybe hunting and finding the right buck is home. We say, well, maybe if I'm around the right people, that's home, but there's still a restlessness in our soul. As St. Augustine said, our souls are restless until they find rest in you. And so Jesus calls his disciples to him. And we live out this life not by trying hard enough or being good enough or trying to will our way into it, by instead responding to him and allowing his life to be fulfilled in us and through us. And Jesus is crazy. <laughs> Can I be honest? Here's the list of what Jesus says it means to live a blessed life. And I don't know about you, but I look at this list and I'm like, I don't, I don't get it because Jesus says, blessed are the poor. Okay. He says, blessed are the hungry. Blessed are the weeping. Blessed are the hatred. And I say, listen, my list looks a little different of those who are blessed. I would say blessed are the rich. Blessed are the full. Blessed are those who laugh. Blessed are those who are loved by everyone. Isn't that what the American dream is all about? That we're supposed to be living in this fullness like Thanksgiving is every day. And yet Jesus shows up on the scene and says, listen, you got it wrong. And all of our culture begins to scratch our heads and say, Jesus, what are you saying? When you're saying that those who are poor and hungry are blessed. You see, these beatitudes are a way of life that start from the heart and work their way out. 
And the crazy thing that I love about this is that Jesus isn't telling us to do or be something that he is not already. The beauty of the Beatitudes is that Jesus is fully these things, that when he deals with us, that he deals with us in humility, that when he walks with us, he walks in poverty, that when Jesus died, that he died in love of you and me, even though we didn't do anything, that Jesus responds to you and I first and foremost in the way of the Beatitudes. And then he invites us into his way of life. And it's only in so far as we invite him and in his understanding of the world that we can live in this new way. So maybe you're like me and you say, okay, fine. I'll, I'll, I'll walk with you, Jesus, in that. But what I don't get, Jesus, is how you can say something like, woe to everybody else. You know, woe feels bad to me. And I thought Jesus was supposed to make me feel good. I thought he was supposed to make me feel like warm and fuzzy on the inside. So who's this guy saying woe to people and what even does woe mean? Uh, you know, hit the woe is something, quo, whoa, I don't know, uh, something like that. It's different today than it was back then. But I wonder as we come to Jesus that woe is not so much something that God does to us as something that happens to us when we step away from Jesus. That just like the farther away we get from a heat source, the colder we get. Just like the farther away we get from light, the more we have darkness. So I wonder if the farther away we get from the source of life, who is Jesus himself, that we begin to live in a space of woe because our soul is made for something different. And so Jesus invites us through blessing to say, come to the one who knows and is life himself. And so he talks to us about the blessed life. And the first beatitude is the one we're going to explore today that says, blessed are you who are poor because the kingdom of God is yours. But woe to you who are rich for you have received your comfort. Now, as we come to poverty, I think about poverty as the welcome mat to flourishing. That Jesus, even in the way that he talks about it, he says, what, that he says, blessed are you who are poor because the kingdom of God is yours. Where the rest of them are, blessed are you who are hungry because you will be satisfied. These things are happening in the present moment of finding poverty and including ourselves in the kingdom of God. And it's an invitation into a different kind of life. Now, as we talk about this idea of blessing, I know that that means different things to us as it did to the biblical authors. And so as I think about that, I think about the word today for English maverick. As you hear that word, maybe for some of us, we think of Tom Cruise and we think about Top Gun. And so if somebody were to call you a maverick, you'd be like, great, I want to be a maverick. I want to have a mustache and feel cool. And so we feel like, okay, we get that. But then maybe we think about maverick in the sense of a business entrepreneur. Or maybe we think about maverick as a, you know, old kind of cowboy sort. And it's this word is used as a bucket for all the different kind of understandings of what that word means. So it is for this idea of Jesus saying that you are blessed. That he says not only are you blessed in that you're blessed in the future, when God will bless you because you are his own. Not only are you blessed in the kind of midterm because in your life there will be blessing as God brings goodness into your life through his spirit. Not only are you blessed in the present, you're blessed in all the spaces. And so I steal from Jonathan Pennington this idea of flourishing is what it means for us to be blessed. That in our relationship with God and ourselves and others that we are flourishing. And so Jesus says, it is those who are flourishing that are those who are poor. Huh. <laughs> what, do, what does that mean, Jesus? That those who are poor, do you mean socioeconomically poor? Are you saying those who have less money are blessed? And maybe a little bit, Jesus would say, well, kind of, because over and over again, we see throughout the gospels that he says it's harder for a rich person to go through uh, into the kingdom of heaven than it is for a rich person to enter uh, through the eye of a needle. No, 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 camel to enter through the eye of a needle. Thank you. And so maybe it is a little bit this idea of those socioeconomically, but there's more to it than that, and there's a greater emphasis than that, and he begins to talk about this spiritual state of those who take on the mantle of poverty, of recognizing that there is need. You see, there is no return of the prodigal without recognition of poverty. 
And it's only as we come to a recognition of our own need that we actually receive from somebody else outside of us. You see, the world wants us to think that it's the people who have a bunch of letters after their names that are blessed. It's the people of a bunch of zeros at the end of their bank account that are blessed. It's the number of square footage in our house that those people are blessed. And we begin to get twisted in thinking it's what we have that make us blessed. But Jesus begins to, to, to remind us that the things that make us blessed is not when we reach out and we try to get something from the outside inside. It's not about how much money we make or how many people give us accolades or how notoriety we have, how much notoriety we have in the world. It's nothing outside of us. Jesus reminds us it's what's from the inside that flows out. And what poverty does is it recognizes its need. That poverty makes it so that we come to the Lord and recognize that we don't have what it takes, that our internal resources are not enough, that we aren't good enough, that we're not strong enough, that we're not able enough, that we're not able to figure this out on our own. And the beginning of the gospel starts with poverty. Do you see that you can't do it on your own? And it's only when we come to the welcome mat of poverty that we can welcome ourselves into the kingdom of God. And so if you feel like there are moments that you feel like I don't have what it takes and I'm not able to do it on my own and I can't figure it out by myself. And if you find yourself at an end of yourself, then it's a blessing from the Lord to remind you it was never about you to begin with. It was always about us reminding ourselves that we need Christ from the inside out changing us so that we might be able to exhibit the fruit of the spirit of goodness and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control, not because we're good enough, but because God is doing something from the inside out. That we understand that we have a right standing before God, not because we are good enough, but because we come to God as beggars, recognizing that it is only by the righteousness of Christ that we can have any semblance of right standing before God. And so we come in a spirit of poverty saying, Lord, I need you. I'm dependent on you to do all of the things that I could by no means do in and of myself. And it is the joy and beauty of the Lord to meet us in that moment and to say, welcome home. Welcome to the space where you are loved and where you can be and not have to try to do it on your own. You see, we are all in need of God to change our hearts. How often have we encountered some situation where there's jealousy or anger or greed or lust or gluttony and find ourselves promising ourselves we'll never do that thing again, only to find ourselves back in the same cycle? The truth is we come to the gospel, it's a gospel of poverty to recognize that the deeply seated wounds of our heart and needs of who we are can only be found and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Lisa Barrett, a psychologist in neuroscience, says this, some brains are more attentive to the people around them and others less, but everyone, everybody has somebody. Ultimately, your family, friends, neighbors, and even strangers contribute to your brain structure and function and help your brain keep your body humming along. This co-regulation has measurable effects. When you're with someone you care about, your breathing can synchronize, as can the beating of your hearts, whether you're in casual conversation or a heated argument. What this means is that the beauty of the kingdom is a recognition that it's not even you come to know Jesus and then you try to live a good life. The beauty of the kingdom is it's only insofar as you are close to Jesus that your life comes in sync with him. And no longer is it a, a striving in and of yourself, but it's as I'm close to Jesus, my heart synchronizes with him so that now what naturally flows out of me are all the things that are natural to Jesus. 
I hope that that gives us some freedom because some of us have been walking around saying this is a heavy burden to carry. And if you feel like Christianity is a heavy burden, then it's evidence that you're trying to do it on your own instead of being in sync with Jesus Christ. And so Jesus invites us in the kingdom through poverty of spirit to synchronize our hearts with the world. And when a community embodies this, there is no pretense. You don't show up saying I've got it all together. And so you just, you come along side and you see how good my life is a community built on reality is a community built off this really beautiful truth of saying you don't have it you are poor and you are desperately in need the the life that you curate on social media is not true it's a lie and so when we come here we remind one another that in the midst of our poverty of spirit that it's there that God meets us we think that God meets us in our strength and he glories in our strength and yet what we find in the gospel of poverty is that God actually meets us in our weakness and glories in those moments when we come to him and say I have nothing and I desperately need you and it's only as a body of Christ comes together where we begin to see the joy and beauty of poverty as we participate in the life of Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 22 and 23 states, And he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. What is the church? It is the space where in every moment of our lives, we come and we cast ourselves before the Lord so that he might fill us in every way. And we become the embodiment of Jesus to the world around us and to one another. And it's only in so far as we point one another to Jesus that we can experience the fullness of what it means to be the body of Christ. And so maybe you're asking, well, what does it look like for me to live in such a way that I, I'm somebody who's poor in spirit? And I have two applications for you today so that we can live in poverty together. Uh, there's an offering basket that's gonna go, no, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Poverty, poverty that is flourishing has love from the inside out rather than love from the outside in. You see, poverty of spirit, when it looks like love, recognizes that you and I are bankrupt when it comes to love. That we like to think that we have a lot in our bank account when it comes to loving people. But in actuality, when we look at our love, we begin to recognize that love from the outside in is conditional. Because love from the outside in says, are you worthy of my love? Because if you're worthy of my love, and if my list of what you've done for me is longer than my list of what I've done for you, then I'll start to do some things for you. Love that's from the outside in says, if you, then all. It's always conditional. Henry Nouwen talks about this conditional kind of love, a love filled with ifs. He says, the world says, yes, I love you if you are good looking, intelligent and wealthy. I love you if you have a good education, a good job, and good connections. I love you if you produce much, sell much, and buy much. There are endless ifs hidden in the world's loves, and these ifs enslave me. These love from the outside in requires that I need you to do something in order for me to love you. And yet Jesus comes along in poverty of spirit. And the church comes in poverty of spirit, realizing that in terms of love, we are bankrupt. <laughs> we have no resources of our own. And so what we do in our poverty is we come to Jesus. And what that means is that from the inside, as we see that he says, we will be found in Christ and he will be found in us. And the Holy Spirit will dwell inside of us. And it's only by means of the supernatural that then as we come in poverty before the Lord and we say, I have nothing in and of myself that we are connected with the divine. And then love flows from the inside out as we are connected with Jesus and as we are connected with the heart of Christ. And so it's almost like we, we look at the resources sourcing of love and we look at Jesus who he himself though he was not loved died for you and me 
It wasn't at our best moment that Jesus said, I'll die for you because you just did a good deed. It was at our worst moment when we turned our back on him that he said, still, in the midst of your unconditional no to me, I will give you an unconditional yes of my love. And it was in the moment on the cross that Jesus displayed that there is an endless ocean of love found in the heart of God himself. And so as we come to Christ over and over again, as we recognize the conditions to our love, as we come to him and as we say, Lord, I need your love and show me the heart of Christ in love that he gives us resources we could never have imagined. And they're inexhaustible in the same way that a kid, when he goes to the ocean and he takes his bucket and he fills it up to make a sandcastle, you wouldn't say after the hundredth bucket for him to fill up water so that he can go and build a sandcastle that there's any less water in the ocean. So for the Christian that we recognize as we come to the heart of Christ, that though it feels like we are filling up bucket after bucket, there is an inexhaustible supply to the beauty of the heart of Jesus Christ. And so we come to him over and over again to recognize our own own ability is not enough. Our inability is evidence of saying, I need Jesus Christ and his inexhaustible love to be able to love the world around me. And so it is only in Jesus Christ that there is poverty of spirit for us to recognize that we need Jesus to take out the ifs out of the love of the world around us and the way that we love the people around us. And it's only then that we experience the beauty of what it means to be close to Jesus in poverty of spirit. Poverty of spirit and finding, not from the outside in, but from the inside out, talks to success. You see, success is much talked about, thought about, imagined, daydreamed about. It's pursued, it's sacrificed for. As a matter of fact, as we think about this idea of success, success is not paid for by money. Success is not paid for by what we do. Success is paid for by our lives. That just like the idols that we would sacrifice to of old and we would give of all of the things of our life, so minute by minute we are sacrificing ourselves on the altar of success saying, is it here? Is it here? And success seeks to be found from the outside in to say, do you approve of me? Do you think I'm successful? Do you think my house is big enough? Do you think I'm doing well enough? Success from the outside in says, if other people affirm me, maybe then I'll feel satisfied. But Jesus offers a very different reality. You see, the world plays a certain type of game. Holly and I, we play games every once in a while. We're not big game people. We, we do once in a while. And so we'll sit down and we'll play a game. And oftentimes games are me against you. We found out in the Labby household, those games don't go well. Uh, we're pretty competitive, and it's not fun to sit down and just, like, feel like you're not having fun. And so we decided that there was a different kind of game. And so there are games out there where it's you against the board. And so you begin to play, and it's both of you working together to say, how can we succeed to bring this thing about? And see, success from the outside in recognizes we're in competition with one another. And it's only in so far as I get more than you, as I have more than you, as I'm doing better than you, that then I feel successful. Jesus comes along and he says, you got the wrong picture. Success from the inside out recognizes that we live in a world that there is an enemy that wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And it's only in so far as we love one another and encourage one another and allow one another to be built up in the Lord that we are able to discover a new way of life. I hope that's the Bible that you're listening to. And so we begin to see this new way of life where it's not me versus you, but it's me and you working together because we understand that it is about God from the inside out whispering to our hearts a different way of being. And doesn't he say that our reward is with him? And so success begins with God in the secret places and he whispers to our hearts, well done, my good and faithful servant. He whispers to us in the midst of our obedience that you are his beloved son and you are his beloved daughter and in you he is well pleased regardless of what the people around you think. And so success that finds poverty of spirit comes before the Lord and simply says, Lord, what do you think of me? Lord, what do you uh, in reality know to be true of me? And it's there that he whispers to our hearts, stop striving after all those things that don't matter and come home to yourself in Jesus Christ where you will always know that his arms are wide open and in 
inviting you close to his heart because that's who he is. And as you do, you'll find that he says, welcome home. I'm pleased with you. And success from the inside out recognizes it's all about the heart of the father that loves you no matter what. You see, as we open up and as we come to the welcome mat of poverty of spirit, it is this welcome into a new kind of world. It's a welcome into a kind of world where we open up the door and we enter into a new home where Jesus begins to talk to us about what it means to hunger after the things that really matter. Jesus talks to us about what it means to weep in the midst of our brokenness so that God might be able to come in and bring in fullness. Jesus offers a new way of life. And every door in the Beatitudes, it's like us coming to a new door and he's saying, welcome home in a new way, into a new way of life. But it all begins with the welcome mat of poverty of spirit. And I almost get this picture of some of us standing at the door wondering, should I open it? Standing at the door wondering, can it be true that I can be unconditionally loved? Can it be true that I can love other people without the if? Could it be true that I could be united with the divine and participate with him from the inside out? And we're standing at the beginning of the Beatitudes, and Jesus just simply says, welcome home to each and every one of us. Welcome to the joy of the Lord. If you would like open up and live in a new kingdom way of life, would you stand with me today? My hope and prayer is that throughout the next seven days, there's seven verses. There's seven different Beatitudes that we're invited into. And I would invite you over the next seven days to just simply say, okay, today I'm just gonna focus on this line. I'm just gonna invite the Lord to speak to me to say, Lord, what does it mean to be this kind of person in the world? And would you allow me to see if it's true? That as you say these things, is it true that I desperately need you? And to allow him to confirm to your spirit that you desperately need him. And for you to be invited into the interior parts of who he is to say, Lord, I need you today. I need you every day. And would you guide me to what it really means to flourish? Not from the outside in as I'm grasping at the world around me, but from the inside out because I've participated with a life with the Lord. Would you pray with me? Lord, we ask that you would confirm and affirm those things that are true. Lord, we ask that as we come before you that we would recognize that we are desperately in need and that in all those areas where we feel like there is a heavy burden on our shoulders, that we would be reminded that Jesus says, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and you will find rest for your souls. And Lord, I pray that as we are united with you, as your life is incarnated through your people, that we might find rest for our souls. That we might find the beauty of what it means to come to you over and over again when we scream at our kids. And instead of going into self-loathing, that we come to you and we say, Lord, remind me that I only have patience in you. That as we have conflict with our spouse, that we would be reminded that there is no ifs in the conditionality of the love of God. And so in that same way, Lord, may we bring our ifs before you and lay them at your feet that we might instead receive unconditional love that flows through us to our spouse. May the church be a place of light, be a place of love, be a place of poverty where we say there's always room at the feet of Jesus. And there may we experience the blessed life the flourishing life, and the life that comes from you. And so, Lord, we hear your words where you say, blessed are you who are poor because the kingdom of heaven is yours. Blessed are you who are hungry now because you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now because you will laugh. Blessed are, are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and insult you and slander your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day 
and leap for joy. Take note because your reward is great in heaven. Lord, may those words become life to our soul and spirit. May they become the warm place from the cold that we so often feel ourselves in. And may they bring life to us from the inside out. We ask all of this in the precious and mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen.